Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Legion New Fronts Dev and Design Panel. I'm Director of Product Development, Will Schick. I'm joined by our fearless developers, uh, lead developer Luke Eddy, and game developer Michael Plummer. How are you doing tonight, gents? Hello. Uh, Will, I, my sound cut out. I didn't hear you, but hopefully that resolves itself. Hopefully it does. Uh, okay, can I can you hear, hear you now. now. Yes, I can. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well, with that issue figured out, uh, welcome, and let's get this thing underway. So I am um, the head of product development, and I think what we wanted to start with tonight is just do some introductions and discuss kind of like what our role is, how we handle things when it comes to the Legion development stuff. And uh, so moving forward from that, my kind of overall role within the product development cycle and with Legion is to help me uh, oversee the vision and the, and the product track. So uh, it's a lot of like talking with Luke and then uh, Michael about where we're going and where we want to go next how we're gonna grow the games, how we're gonna expand the player experience, and overall just maintaining the health and the longevity of these amazing games. And I think it's important to note that unlike uh, how some other studios handle things in terms of the overall uh, game development and design duties, one of the big things that we really love at Atomic Mass is the idea of um, collaboration as a means of creation. And so we do entrust certain individuals like Mr. Luke Eddy with the kind of oversight of certain game lines, uh, specifically Legion for Luke, but also Luke has taken on the general role of lead developer for Armada and X-Wing. Um, and Michael Plummer, who has just come on, is kind of assisting directly with those games. That is kind of their overview, their, their normalized purview. Um, the important thing to note is that, um, hold on one second, we seem to be getting some reverb here that's going on, and I don't quite know why. Um, let's do, oh, I think I know why. Let's do that. And now, let's see if it's fixed. How about that? Is it fixed now? It, it is a bit better. Uh, I was hearing two wills at once. Two wills at I once. I know. With it, but it was I was too. We'll just let it go. No, no, no we're fixed now. Uh, right. It's good for the it's good for the chat. It was bad for you too. So I guess I'll take that as well. Um, so as I was saying uh, before, we had to figure out why you were hearing me five thousand times like Dodger Stadium. Uh, the the overall kind of idea, the way in which Atomic Mass Games functions in terms of development and design, is a collaborative is a collaborative environment. The idea behind that is that we do entrust individuals like Luke Eddy. Uh, with the general oversight. They are the experts. They are the ones who kind of um, advise and make final decisions because they know the most about the game lines. However, every game developer and designer, uh, everyone that you met at the panel, if you joined us for the game and design panel yesterday, uh, which was a great, great time. We talked a lot, a lot about design philosophy and development philosophy. Um, we're all engaged in every game that we make. Um, everybody is coming to the table, going to the meetings, discussing, coming up with new ideas, and working towards a, a similar goal, which is to make great new content for all these great games. Uh, with that, it means that we don't really identify one person whose whole role is to simply go through and make that thing. Instead, we like a much more communal and, again, collaborative environment where that happens. So as we go through this, know that it's not just the three of us who work uh, directly with Legion. It's a whole group effort, uh, including um, Sarah Rowan, who you might have met if you watched the panel yesterday, and, of course, um, our other lead developer, uh, William Pagani, who also takes an active hand. Uh, we look very much to Luke with his experience and his knowledge base on uh, what these games are bringing. Um, and we're very excited to dive in and learn more and become experts ourselves as we move forward. Uh, but that kind of gives you an overview. I think it's an important uh, distinction between kind of how um, FFG handled uh, game development and kind of their philosophies versus how AMG prefers to handle things like game development as well as more of a group-minded effort where everybody has a responsibility and a role in making things really awesome. And there are no specific one people driving the ship. 
Uh, with that, let's go ahead and I'm just going to stop talking now and turn over. Um, I'm going to ask Michael Plummer, why don't you go ahead and just give us kind of your role in terms of this big group effort and how things work. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm working a lot on X-Wing and Armada and Legion, and my first project was Unconventional Warfare, and my experience with that was just, you know, kind of taking ideas that are put out by the, the larger creative team of devs, so, you know, mainly you and Luke in this case, and then kind of refining them down and using the tool inside of the sandbox that is the rule set of a game to try and make them evoke something when you play, right? And uh, to, to make sure that the rules are, are, are balanced against one another and that they're fun to play without ruining anyone's experience and, and that they work, of course, right? Like that's the very you know nuts and bolts of it is do the words make sense on the card and can people figure out what it's supposed to do? Um, and then beyond that, also just sharing gen general ideas and thoughts of the way that, that things on other projects are going, like, like Shik said, we, we work very collaboratively. So, you know, get to put my hands in all the pots and that's nice. And, and really just kind of honing down the greater ideas into the, the nuts and bolts of words on a card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, as, as somewhat of a newcomer, like we both are, um, to the game and just diving into the development, it's been really exciting to kind of re-explore uh, Legion to look at the future possibilities for mass battle action and to take all of the great ideas and the plans that were laid out by one Mr. Luke Eddy, who will be talking next, um, and kind of reevaluate and redefine what those plans can be and how we can push them even further than maybe was possible before they had such dedicated and um, focused effort in terms of a true miniatures game studio behind them. So, Mr. Luke Eddy, this is kind of your show. I think um, from this point on, we'll be looking to you not only to be lead developer for Legion, but also for this panel. Oh man, so much responsibility. <laughs> well, um, I, first of all, I'm excited to be working with both of you on Legion and on other games. As um, Will was saying, yeah, it's a collaborative effort on everything we do. And, you know, that was a um, that was a philosophy we had at Fantasy Flight, and that's a philosophy that Atomic Mass Games has as well. And I think we're making a, a, a conscious effort, even more so at Atomic Mass, to do that, to have everybody sort of collaborating on each of the different game lines and contributing. So, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, each of us isn't locked into maybe one game line that we're working on. You know, I'm going to be helping with future products for not just Legion, but Star Wars and, uh, or <laughs> all Star Wars, uh, X-Wing and Armada. Um, but also, you know, at some point too, I'm sure I'll, you know, have a hand in some, um, you know, Marvel uh, MCP uh, expansions as well. So there's a lot of fluidity there, which I, I really appreciate, which is really cool and exciting. So um, in terms of what, some of what I do, you know, um, I've been working on Legion since um, before it came out. I got to help do um, development on sort of the, the the core set, the original core set of the game. You know, the design was already there, but we were still working on you know some of the the specific units and some iterations of how certain things worked. So um, I got to help out with that, and then beyond that, then you know was designer and d developer for many of the expansions that came out. So. Um, I've been with Legion, you know, the whole life of the game and have had many, many things that, you know, we've been thinking about doing in the future and, you know, cool plans for other things we want to see and other directions we want to go. And what's really cool with um, this game line moving over to AMG is that, you know, Will and, you know, these other guys are excited about that too. And they have cool plans for what we could do in the future as well. So the, the future is very bright for, Star Wars Legion, all the Star Wars game lines, really, you know, because everybody is interested and invested in, you know, what we can do that's new and exciting and cool. And um, again, having been working on Legion for a long time, I've had lots of time to think about, you know, what can we add to the game? What would be cool to do in the future? And it's cool that, you know, uh, looking ahead, I'm seeing, you know, those things coming to fruition, you know, so mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about some cool stuff coming up, but like there's stuff even beyond this that I'm super excited for, but you know, we can't talk about that quite yet. One thing at a time. We have to save some spoilers, as I always say, for Mini Stravaganza 2, um, which will likely be coming a lot sooner than I think some people might expect. Um, <laughs> and hopefully they're very excited by that, by that news. Um, we have a lot of work ahead of us. 
So yeah, so one of the things I think we can touch on first in terms of kind of um, an initial, you know, you talked about Luke how you we've had you've had a lot of plans initially there, and now we've kind of have this new unification where we have a new focus in terms of um, how the studio functions. We've talked a lot about this in terms of um, our communications and kind of like when the whole exchange happened and we took over ownership of these great games. But I think one of the biggest ways in which um, we've kind of exerted or expanded on our influence initially, um, because the timelines for creating miniatures and stuff are so far out, um, the the most immediate impact will likely be on organized play. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about this, and this is something I know Michael is very, very passionate about, and one of the reasons we were very excited to bring him on board um, was kind of expanding upon the great foundations that already existed for all the Star Wars games, but especially Legion, uh, in terms of creating new game experiences, new game modes, and also building on the great um, past that already exists. So, Michael, why don't you walk us through some of the things that we've discussed internally, some things that we can look forward to in the future, um, anything that you want to touch on in terms of, like, uh, some of those crazy ideas that are rolling around in that head. Yeah, you know, we've we've talked a lot about organized play when, when we're at work and in, in kind of the philosophies of AMG and specifically around new game modes and um, narr narrative experiences and, and th those really excite me and um, I think I think new game modes are really interesting and I think, you know, some, some people get scared when they hear a new game mode because they, they don't understand how to play their game anymore. But I, I talked about it a little bit, um, I think, in the X-Wing Armada panel, but it, I, I feel like it's a great way to bring back that new game experience because I think everyone can remember a time when they were first getting into a game, maybe it's Legion, and you remember when you first got into Legion and all your friends were and you were cracking open boxes and all huddled around rule books and you just couldn't stop talking about it. And that excitement just naturally kind of dies down after a little while, you know, the honeymoon ends and you kind of solved the game. So new play modes are just a great way for us to bring communities together in a way where they're, they're looking at something new and fresh that no one has seen before. And it, it sort of levels that playing field of knowledge and planning and skill that exists because there's something that's brand new to everyone. And I think that that's just a really exciting and interesting way to do these OP events. And then, of course, narrative events. You know, there are so many great stories in Star Wars. They're, they're yeah. countless. And, you know, we... When I play games, I'm often thinking, well, how can I how can I reenact this battle? Like, I don't have the the historical gamer thing happening quite yet. I think I'm a few years away from that. But I start to I start to think about you know Star Wars historicals. Like, how can I use Legion to tell the story of the battle on Endor? Like, that would be very fun for me. Or the battle on Hoth. And so, I think that we're going to explore a lot of ways to to go to those locales in our own battles and uh, share that with our players. And that's going to be great. And then, of course, uh, you know, we're going to have things like Vader Down that uh, mm -hmm. we've talked about. And I actually just finished reading the comic for another time, and I'm excited to get working on that one. Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously the first kind of look at what to expect from these different kind of styles of approaches has been unconventional warfare, which has happened the last three days. Uh, as we've discussed a little bit before, those materials are going to remain on the website. So we're highly encouraging folks out there who really like them to use them in future events, to use them in your community. You know, just because uh, you may not be able to report your events to determine the outcome of some alternate art cards for organized play, doesn't make those uh, doesn't make those variances on list building or the special abilities any less useful. You know, doing a three round event at your store when it opens back up at some point if you want to relive the glory of unconventional warfare. One of the things that I kind of want to throw out there, too, and I think building on what Michael said, one of the things that I always look for in any game that I want to play is value. How do I get the most value out of the time and the, and the energy that I spend in my hobby? And because, you know, again, we've talked about this before in other panels, miniatures games have such a high level of investment. You're assembling your miniatures. You're painting them the way that you want. You're thinking about lists and you're creating all this stuff. I love any time... I have an opportunity to utilize that vast repository of my collection in different and unique ways. Whether that's just one time for a special three-day event over a convention, or if it's something that I want to bring back over and over again in different points in time. Um, Any time that you can get those expansion rules, those different modes of play, to me it's very exciting as a lifelong hobby miniatures gamer, and it's something that I think is really important to overall the longevity and the fun that can be had with these products. So I'm very excited to continue to drill in more to that. And it certainly, um, you know, unsurprisingly perhaps, has really driven our mentality at Atomic Mass Games about organized play. 
And specifically to Legion, one thing that's really compelling about the game for me, and as it pertains to organized play, and specifically these different play modes, is there are so many interesting mechanics in the way that the game works between command cards and orders and keywords. So there's a lot of room to play. There's a lot of toys in this sandbox uh, that is Legion. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we like to say with uh, designing Legion, there's a lot of levers and dials to pull. So <laughs> it's real easy to tweak things through, you know, uh, variations on units gaining keywords. You know, perhaps it's some sort of progressive sort of campaign narrative. And oh, the, you know, this veteran, this rebel trooper unit has survived battle after battle, and it's accrued multiple keywords that makes it almost mm -hmm. more like a special forces unit. You know, or you can easily modify the stats of units, you know, or change how, you know, you alluded to how command cards are played, you know, or uh, unconventional warfare is a great example of tweaking some of these things, you know, in the day three perks that we uh, just released for today, the, uh, what is the the hero hammer track called again? That's uh, the uh, on, lead, on from the lead from the front. Yeah, yeah. So they just unlocked a, uh, their last perk is, um, or no, it was their day two perk that I think they got the double. the command hand. Yes. Which which was it? Which was the double elimination? Uh, oh, the double elimination. Um, now now you've got me questioning. We moved I'll, these things around. I'll pull it up. A whole bunch while we were working on it. So I forget where you got it. But that's an example of tweaking even just that turn zero like battle builder phase where oh they don't just eliminate one card you know once per that you know um, battle card setup phase they can eliminate two cards you know so Day three, again that was today. OK, that was today, yes. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of different interesting things you can do with the Legion rule set. There's so many different little elements to it that you can tweak and use to sort of build interesting um, game modes and ways to play you know, and sort of add interesting flavor to games and to scenarios without really having to change the fundamental rules of the game. So that's something that's pretty cool, and that's something that we're going to definitely leverage in the future for other organized play um, type materials. And I have one last thing about unconventional warfare before we move on to the future of Legion, and that is I don't think we've told the Legion players what card they're going to get alternate arc mm -hmm. for if they're side wins, and that is going to be the force upgrade force push. Mm -hmm. Probably the best force upgrade in the game. So yes, if you want to see that future art of that card for the light side or for the dark side, you know, go try and get in a, a game or two if you can and report those games uh, on the website to sway the balance of the force for uh, say, how the art of that card comes And out. now we just watch as everybody stops watching us and runs out to go play a very quick skirmish game of Legion oh, so that they can <laughs> change everything around. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what the future holds. Uh, there's there's kind of two tracks. Um, we've, we've previewed um, several of the things that are coming up in the imminent future, you know, in the next couple of months. Uh, we wanted to dive in today and really look at the two new vehicles that are coming out, the AA5 speeder truck and the LAT LE. And moving beyond that, we also kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about what to expect in the future uh, beyond these, these two vehicles. And that specifically has been things that we've been showing uh, with the Yoda reveals, the Wookiee reveals, stuff like that. And that is the mm -hmm. Kashyyyk wave. And I think there's some interesting uh, stuff to talk about in terms of how that wave will have resonating effects that will have ripple effects going forward in terms of legion design that we can kind of hint at um, and talk about so uh, to start i think we want to just dive in and really start talking about um, these two new vehicle units and all of the cool things that they bring to the table um, and mr luke uh, yeah I'm allow you to kind of take over the helm here i am simply going to put up this really fancy uh, Exclusive first look at the studio painted AA5, which looks yeah. gorgeous. Um, so tell us a little bit about the genesis of this vehicle. Um, give us all the good intel and details. Uh, let me know when you want to actually post up the unit card, and I will be happy to do that for you as well. Uh, but yeah, let's let's hear about the Rebels' new sweet ride. Yeah, their sweet ride, absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to give some insider info on this. Both of these vehicles were a ton of fun to to work on to come up with i think so the the genesis of course uh, is pretty straightforward it was just that hey the original two factions are due for another set of heavy vehicles and we've been planning um I mean, pretty much from the beginning of the game or at least since we did the um 
the open transports, the land speeder and the occupier tank, um, back when we were doing the Rogue One theme stuff, that like, hey, we're going to do closed transports at some point. And um, the wave that these are included in, you know, which also had the, the specialist packs for the prequel factions, it had um, Lando and Callus and Anakin and Darth Maul, that whole set of units was kind of a like, you know, what what do we need to add to the game before we, you know, move on to other exciting stuff? You know, like what are the things we got to like sort of a catch all of cool characters that like are fan favorites that we really want to see in the game and some expansions that are important for the existing factions. And of course, the prequel factions hadn't had their specialist packs yet. And um, the original factions, again, we hadn't gotten yet to doing actual closed transport. So for the Imperials, it was relatively easy because, you know, uh, we actually had a couple things to choose from, like they transport troops all the time. The rebels, it was a little tougher. You know, there's the little like sort of uh, airport um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing that they drive around in the hangars to get the oh, pilots. Oh, like Yavin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like that was actually proposed, and we're like, ah, I, I don't think that's quite what we're looking for. Um, there is a trans. There is a transport awesome. you see actually in the Vader Down comic. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's kind of uninspired. It's another open transport. So I really had to dig deep, and I looked through you know all the different possible expanded universe type transports rebels could have. There's lots of vehicles that they have in um, some of the pre um, Disney computer games um, in a bunch of RTSs. The art style of a lot of those is sort of off a little bit sometimes to that sort of Star Wars feel. Mm -hmm. But there was this AA5 speeder truck, and it was from the EU, and it had gotten updated a little bit in uh, one of the mobile games that was put out under Disney. So it was technically canon, um, <laughs> but it didn't look this good. And when I proposed it, there was some doubt as to like, oh, do we, do we really want to just do that? It, it's kind of a box. Mm -hmm. But I was mm -hmm. like, no, 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 it's the right it's the right shape. It feels Star Wars-y. You just got to junk it up. You got to give it those greebles, the guts on the outside. <laughs> you just have to have faith in our hard pl plastic sculptor, our hard surface sculptor, Bexley, who does amazing work on all of our X-Wing ships. He can do it. He can make this look Star Wars-y. And my faith was well-placed because <laughs> it looks amazing. It's perfect for the Rebel Alliance. It, it does feel, having painted it now, it, it feels exactly like what I would expect out of a loose band of like political insurrectionists. Like it's just, they bought this thing off of a lot or a junkyard, strapped a gun to it. And they were like, let's do this. This is great. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and he went all out too, because, you know, as you've seen, it has a fully furnished interior. It has a cockpit with a windshield. We've got a Sullustin inside piloting it. Like there was no, no holds barred here. Like it was, it, he went above and beyond with this. All right, well, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about, we've talked about the Genesis, let's talk about the actual rules. So closed yeah. transports, um, I know this is a big deal. This is this is the first time. So mm -hmm. tell, us, tell us a bit about that. Like, uh, you know, how, how did it feel to finally utilize a rule type that had been sitting there just laying fallow for so long? Yeah, well, it, honestly, it, it was kind of easy. I mean, you look at the, the speeder truck and none of those keywords are actually new. You know, mm -hmm. armor's been in the game forever. Hover ground is the same keyword we gave those, the low flying, slow moving repulsors um, that uh, it's the same keyword that the tanks have, mm -hmm. the, um, the AAT and the Sabre tank. Uh, reposition, that's the same keyword that the occupier has. There's that transport one closed keyword that's existed in the game since <laughs> way four. Here it is, finally on a card. And, you know, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. I think the, the most difficult part was actually making this more interesting than what mm -hmm. you see here, which we're going to save that content for the future. But if you look at the side there, it has a lot of upgrade slots. And you're going to have a lot of interesting options to fill those slots with. So when you actually upgrade this, like that's where the, the really the interesting part of this is, is mm -hmm. all those upgrade slots and the options you have there to essentially turn this into not just a transport, but also sort of a mobile command center almost. Because mm -hmm. a lot of those crew slots are gonna give you, and, and pilot slot are gonna give you interesting effects that you know in, influence the units, your uh, other units on the battlefield by you know buffing them or perhaps healing them, sort of a mobile mm -hmm. hospital type thing. So. Um, 
yeah, it was interesting. That's that's where the interesting design was. The actual mm -hmm. like chassis of this, very basic, very straightforward, and you can just run it like that. Because that was the other thing we tried to do. It's very cheap, only seventy five points. If you just need to get, say, your Wookiee warriors, your melee unit from point A to point B, and have them protected <laughs> from enemy fire, and just jump out right next to some enemies and wreck face for only seventy five points, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some of those hard point options. So I know we have the heavy laser retrofit uh, on the list to talk about. This thing looks pretty fun. I like, I you know, I like, I like multiple colors of dice. Uh, it's got great range. Yeah. So I imagine that this kind of turns it with the hover rules more into a bit of a mobile gun platform, a little bit more support that can still get people where they want to go. Exactly. Yeah. This is this is your budget. <laughs> excuse me. Your budget option for a weapon. Now it has no weapon on the actual card. So if you wanted to shoot anything at all, you do have to pay for an upgrade. But this is the cheap one. You know, the range is nice. Dice are passable. Critical one helps get some damage through. But this is your pot shot weapon. You know, hopefully you get, a, a, you know, with a red die in there, you know, and, you know, three potentially plus the critical, you could maybe get some damage in through cover. But it's not going to be a lot. This is just to sort of have the vehicle able to at least lend some firepower to the battlefield. And for 16 points, that's not a bad deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there is going to be a bigger, bigger, better, cooler gun that we'll show you later on in preview articles for if you really want to turn this into like a weapons platform. Right. And both of those, both those weapon options are available on the frame for the, the vehicle itself. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I really liked is the way that it's designed. You can plug and play each weapon, and of course you can turn them. I find it's most important when I play with vehicles that I can make the little sound as the turret turns around, and if I can't do that, I'm not having fun. But you got to aim at the enemy unit. That's, you do, otherwise that's, you're just going to miss. Cool. Yeah, there's no way your dice are going <laughs> to hit if the gun isn't pointed right. Yeah, exactly. the, the dice can't see if the gun can't see. True facts. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a little bit about how the different crew upgrades uh, can really change how this vehicle functions within your Rebel list. Um, I know that we have one that I've seen fans yes. clamoring for forever, uh, being a Battlefront 2 fan myself. I, I'm excited to see Shriv show up again. Uh, mm -hmm. So go ahead and talk a little bit about what he brings to the table when it comes to the AA-5. Yeah, we had to show off at least one pilot upgrade, and I know people are excited for the field commander. Um, upgrades. Uh, this vehicle um, and the LAT as well, they're going to add field commanders to the Rebel Alliance and the Imperial factions. So Shriv is, um, he's not exclusive to the AA-5. So he's a heavy vehicle, so you could run him in your land speeder or your um, your uh, snow speeder. You know, he's a consummate pilot. He can handle pretty much everything. And that field commander keyword there, so the text you see on the card is sort of its basic effect while it's in game, but it also has another effect where if you build your army with a field commander um, uh, unit or upgrade in that army, you don't have to field a commander. This field commander takes the place of that commander and you know you can do some interesting things with that. You could have an army that is sort of led by your speeder truck outfitted with a bunch of support upgrades you know, and maybe another heavy vehicle and a bunch of Tauntauns perhaps, or, you know, ATRTs, and you have those extra points to fill out a, an interesting army that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise if you had to spend points on, say, a commander. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty cool. And so that gives you a lot of interesting list building opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he also has another effect, which is just, just really good, which is as a free action, choose a, f a friendly unit, so one that you are transporting or one at range one to two, and it just it gains a dodge token, and if it wants, it can also gain a suppression token. So mm. that's real good for units that have um, danger sense, so like Jyn Erso or the Pathfinders. They want that suppression token, so you can buff those. And of course, uh, just basic Rebel Troopers love getting dodge tokens. They have the nimble <laughs> keyword, so they can keep it. So mm -hmm. Shriv has just some nice good synergy with just a lot of basic Rebel units. So um, he's, a, he's a solid buy, even if you aren't using him for the Field Commander ability. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the next vehicle, because we do still have a lot to cover, and that is my personal favorite, partly because you know I've been building my, my clone army up, my 104th. So I'm excited to put this on the table with them, uh, which is the LAT LE. So not, yeah. not the LAT that a lot of people think of when you hear LAT. Um, this is the more the patrol vehicle. Mm -hmm. But yes. uh, super amazing, super amazing miniature, uh, joy to put together. Bexley again, I believe mm -hmm. was the sculptor on this. 
Um, so let's just go ahead and talk right into it about uh, the design, kind of the impetus behind it, and I'm going to bring up the rules card so we can just continue to move yeah, right get along. Yeah, that up on the screen there. I love Here that mini. Are. It's great. Oh, yeah. It's gorgeous. I mean, and again, even better in person, too. Cool. So you can see right away that uh, if you hadn't caught on already, the lat is for the Imperial faction and for the Republic faction. So they're both getting a unit. Now, the unit cards are identical. So there's nothing different between them other than their rank, or the rank's the same, other than their faction. Um, but uh, yeah, this is also not necessarily a gun platform. It comes with the guns built in, and you know they're nothing to shake a stick at. They're pretty good, you know one one black or one red, three black. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly, its role is as that transport. So you know it has a lot of keywords we've seen before: armor, it has cover, like other flying vehicles. It has hover though, hover air two instead of speeder. So it doesn't just speed around you know, the battlefield, like most repulsor vehicles we've seen. It's more of a like a helicopter almost. It's sort of is hovering in place. It still can ignore all that terrain. Instead of getting those automatic moves, it can instead strafe back and forth, which you use those side notches on the base for. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then at the end there, you've got the basic transport one keyword again, which, you know, means you can transport a unit around the battlefield without having to worry about them getting shot. So, you know, you can get Vader or Obi-Wan Kenobi right into the middle of a battle without having to worry about them taking any enemy fire on the way there. Oh, and it's more spicy due, due to the fact that that could happen at the same time. You could literally fly them and their sweet lat LEs towards each other so that they can have their <laughs> epic rematch duel. Yeah, rematch, yeah. there you go. Yeah, all right. Um, for those asking in the chat, it does come with different pilot options because the mm -hmm. you can obviously see through the clear canopy. So you do get Imperial and uh, clone pilot options as well. Um, mm -hmm. And let's talk about one of those pilot options, I think, is next. Oh, no. We want to talk about the non-clone pilot option first. Excuse me. I got to fall, I gotta fall uh. Luke's lead here. Um, so Governor Price uh, is one of the upgrade cards for the Imperials. Mm -hmm. Yes. So similar to Shriv, Governor Price adds Field Commander as an option to the Imperials, and uh, she can go on any heavy vehicle. So this could be on uh, the tank, uh, the, the Occupier tank, or it could be on ATST. Same Field Commander effect. Um, you know, it lets you field just that unit as your commander and skip points. Uh, you not have to spend points on a regular commander. Her effect is. Um, Interesting, it's sort of a riff on what Shriv does. You know, Price is not Price is not the best leader. She kind of, you know, <laughs> tells people what to do and, you know, doesn't really care about, you know, whether they make it out alive or not. So um, she can give them an aim token, which is great, possibly more powerful than a dodge token. But that suppression effect, they don't get a choice. They have to take it. When she tells them what to do, they're like, you know, OK, OK, we're, we're, we're doing it. They may not want that suppression. Or it could work out all right. Maybe they need the cover. She mm. is dedicated to the mission, not to her men. Oh, yes, harsh. very true. Super harsh. All right, let's move on to the Clone Commander option, which is Clone Commander Fox. Yeah, Clone Commander Fox. He is uh, in charge of the Coruscant Security Force. So he is um, he's a cool dude who also, again, has that same field commander effect and has a similar ability there where, uh, again, it's sort of riffing on the same effect. He gives out a surge token. Uh, and then he may remove a suppression token, so he can sort of rally his troops a little bit. Nice. 